Sounds like nobody else is coming, so I'm free. So good evening and welcome to a um, Oak Harbor City Council special workshop meeting. Today is December 18th. Uh, it is 5 o'clock p.m. and I'd like to call that meeting to order. I think we have uh, our council here that is that is planning to attend. I know that we've heard from Joel, Jim, and Rick that they will not be here. So um, uh, let's just get started by introducing around the table and we'll go on to the fire department soon thereafter. So, uh, Councilor Larson. Bill Larson, City Council. Erica Wassinger, City Council. Blaine Noborn, City Administrator. And I'm Bob Severins, Oak Harbor Mayor. So uh, our first item tonight on the agenda is Fire Department Island County Hazard Mitigation Plan. I see we have some candy at the table. I don't know how that got there, <laughs> Mayor. I Chief have no doesn't know. <laughs> Chief Ray Merrill has joined us at the table. Welcome, Chief. Thanks, Mayor and Council. Um, as you may remember, five years ago, we were involved with the Island County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Uh, they do it every five years, so that's why it's five years from now, or from five years since then. Um, as part of that plan, it includes all of Island County and all the different agencies. So it'd be us, the City of Langley, Coopville, uh, the Port Districts, the Fire Districts, as well as us. Uh, the benefits is being part of that mitigation plan. Uh, after a disaster, we can claim FEMA money. If we're not part of the hazard mitigation plan, we can't go after that monies uh, for disasters and relief. Uh, another good part of that is we can certain put certain projects into the plan that we may be able to get grant funding for. Uh, so I've got some projects I'm looking at. Uh, I've talked with uh, Mr. Powers earlier this year about that uh, and Mr. Beebe. Uh, they provided me some information that we're gonna add to that plan that we may be able to get grant funding for. Uh, if we don't ask, we'll never know. Uh, we did participate in 2015. Uh, their part of this is community <coughs> outreach, uh, so that uh, we'll be sending surveys out to the community through websites, uh, through some gatherings. Uh, this is a FEMA grant sponsored process, but with that there's a 10% match, and our match for the city is in kind of 40 hours of work into the plan. Uh, so 40 hours. I usually get that in between Friday night and Saturday morning sometime. <laughs> and uh, so I've already attended two of the different meetings. Uh, we've got seven or eight more meetings throughout the next two or three months. Uh, we get our 40 hours in and then we do get some, some benefit from that. Uh, we have to look at the different hazards that could possibly hit Whidbey Island, uh, whether they be natural or man-made disasters. Uh, there's a rating scale to determine the potential the likelihood and how that could impact us uh, short term, medium term, and long term as well. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into this mitigation plan. They also include part of our CEMP into that plan. Uh, so that's kind of where we're going in the next few months. Why you need to know is because sometime between February, March, or April, I'll probably be coming back with a resolution uh, to be part of that, uh, just so that you're, you're aware of what's happening. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Mayor Broken. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in my mind, it's related, but it might not be. When there is a crisis or something, the council is supposed to go to the fire station. We get a clipboard, tells us what we're supposed to do and stuff. Will you encompass the um, what happens with this also with that? You do like a review? possibly this next year with council? What we have in the works right now is next month at the, the workshop, uh, I'm gonna be doing a training session on the CEMP and what your responsibilities are going to do. And then not too long after that, we're gonna hold a drill that you guys are gonna participate in and find out what it's all about. I'm mm -hmm. smiling right now, you can tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So that, that is in the works and, and, and how all these mold together uh, especially if we have to declare a disaster of some sort. So that's what we're working towards. Okay, thank you very much, Chief. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Okay. That's all I got then. <laughs> we're ahead of schedule. I could talk a lot more about no, something yeah. else. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chief. So we'll invite. Uh,
City Attorney Nikki Esparza and Finance Director Patricia Soul to the table. Welcome. Patricia has volunteered me to speak on this. <laughs> <laughs> she would do it so much more succinctly than myself. Patricia. Was <laughs> I called the short straw? I got the short straw today. She has the education and she wrote it, so you know, you know it intimately. Okay. Well, we'll see about that. So, um, when we were looking at whether or not we needed to make changes to our B&O tax code based on the um, requirements that um, cities who impose B&O taxes make changes by January of this next year, um, we discovered a couple of things. First of all, the city doesn't impose a B&O tax, and so we are not required to make any of the changes that other jurisdictions are required to make. However, um, when we were looking at the code that talks about B&O you know, taxes, what came to light is that we have a real mess in 370 and 371. Um, 370 and 371 reference utility or B&O you know, taxes, but really what they're talking about is utility taxes. And they bring in utility taxes, they bring in licensing requirements, and it's, um, it's just a mess. So 370 was the original utility tax code. It was passed in 1987 initially, and it set tax rates at 3%. Um, over the years, we added in more utilities, and we changed the tax rates. And in 99, there were some changes made that increased rates, but had sunset dates. So instead of cleaning up the code in 370 <coughs> when those sunset dates, after those sunset dates had passed, um, the council at that time reimposed the new taxes under 371. So we have two tax codes that are referencing the same utility rates, or the same utilities, but one of them shows a 7% and one of them shows a 6.25%, and, and it's just a mess. Um, clearly, the 7% the rates, they've already sunset, but if you were reading the code, you wouldn't know that, right? So. Um, we decided that we needed to make some changes and so what we've done is we've drafted a an ordinance that doesn't change any of the rates of course but merges 370 and 371 um, and eliminates the confusion that would obviously come if you're reading the code and saying well I, I see seven percent here and I see six and a quarter here what's what's the correct rate so we've drafted an ordinance that combines the two chapters Essentially, we're just going to eliminate 370 and call it 371. It puts some of the procedures from 371, um, merges that with some of the rates in 370, or some of the language in 370, cleans up the language a bit to try and make sure that we are um, consistent with the model business license ordinance that we passed in the last year that the state's requiring. Um, we also put in, uh, a percentage for the Arts Commission Fund. Um, in the past, it's been, it's supposed to be done um, with the biennial, biennial budget, and it's just always been the 0.25%, so we just put that into code. Um, so we just finalized our draft, and we can get that sent out to you so you can take a look at it. But this you will see at a soon future council meeting, I'm not sure which one, but hopefully it'll provide for some clarity that certainly is lacking if you're looking at the two codes together. And I created definitions that were consistent with what we were taxing off of, the gas, gas utilities, electric utilities, all of that is in there now. Um, and it flows so much better because when you read the two codes together, you were left wondering what you were supposed to do. <laughs> so. We uh, past practice was 6.25 for um, the different utilities. 6% was for? 6% is actually the um, <coughs> statutory maximum for electric, phone, um, and gas and steam. But the um, solid, uh, solid waste, wastewater, and water all get 6.25 6. that goes into the general fund as utility tax. And then of that total, 0.25 is moved into the arts fund. So it'll be more clear in the in the actual code changes, but it before was extremely confusing. 
And Nikki and Anna did all of the wonderful language changes, and it was really clean and clear. So does 685 go away then and, and uh, 370? 370 goes away and 371 becomes the utility tax code. Okay. And it was originally called business and occupation tax code, which that wasn't accurate at all. It's not a B and O tax. And you will be sending that to us in advance. We'll be sending it to you via email. Uh, is that a long code? No. It's okay. Not it's not, not but then when it'll be in the packet when we bring it forward for approval also. But and we will get it to you. No anticipated changes from the existing numbers. From our draft, mm -hmm. yeah. We didn't change any of the percentages. There's no, no new yeah. taxes. Okay. So we just wanted it to simplify so it was much easier for people to understand what, what we were really trying to accomplish. It's only a nine-page ordinance, so it's okay. not a huge one. Mm -hmm. So it's really only housekeeping. It is definitely housekeeping. Yeah. Questions? Councilman? Okay, thank you for that. We will move on to um, legal department graffiti cleanup ordinance. And since Kevin um, is the one that came up with this, he needs to draw the first. <laughs> <laughs> you get any? You will. Uh, so you've had a chance to read the ordinance. Uh, in essence, and there may be a question here: Is graffiti that much of an issue for us? It's not. Uh, a huge issue for us, but it does occur. Uh, the reason, and we borrowed this code from, from another city. Uh, Nikki put it into the uh, uh, code enforcement section. We talked about it in a public safety work group meeting. <coughs> really what this is for is when we have graffiti, and we ran into one instance of this downtown where we had a heck of a time getting the owner, uh, contacting that owner, and then getting them to do anything about the graffiti uh, it took us like months and eventually we were able to contact somebody who said yeah go ahead and, um, and deal with it so in essence what this does is puts a responsibility of the graffiti cleanup on the property owner which is where it really belongs anyways uh, but it, uh, it allows a notice to be served uh, via certified mail or in person to the uh, property owner giving them a set amount of days 15 days to take care of the graffiti and if they don't then it allows us as a city to either go in and clean it up or contract with someone to go clean it up and the costs are uh, the owner of the property bears the burden of that cost should the city so desire to um, put it there so uh, my experience um, where i came from we, we this is we implemented this and i'm not aware of an instance where we ended up building the owners may have occurred. It allows it to occur. Most of the time it's something where we can go in and assist them or they'll do it themselves, which is what the, uh, what the purpose of this is. Obviously with graffiti, the reasons to clean it up so fast, uh, it can decrease property value because of the blight. Um, it can encourage additional graffiti uh, by other people. They can embolden that person because their graffiti is up there and so they want to see it more. Uh, this, it's much better if it can be taken care of in a timely fashion um, for multiple reasons. So that's in essence what this does. It prepares us, it gives us that tool, which I don't anticipate us needing very often, but when we do, at least we have a timeline that we can set, which is a little, I guess for lack of a better word, a little speedier than what a normal code enforcement type of process might be because of the nature of, of that. It's, you know, if it's on a business where everybody can see it right next to another one, so that's in essence what this does. And I'm open for questions. Nikki, anything I didn't cover on that? In essence? Yes, Councilor Larson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you both for the work on this. I did read through this. I like the fact that there is a specific and short time frame in there, 15 days. Um, this is not a new ordinance. It just adds to an ordinance we already have on the books to give us a little bit more latitude to get these things uh, handled in a timely manner. I do remember we've had issues in the past and while we tried to resolve those issues, the graffiti remained. So this is uh, a tool for us where if there is an issue like that um, moving forward, uh, it gives the city the ability to get rid of that and then deal with who's going to pay what afterwards. So uh, thanks. I think this uh, makes sense and it's very straightforward. Appreciate it. And I might add, if I could add just real quick, there, there is a, um, 
an appeal process, so to speak, that's built in to the code. So if somebody wants to enact that before that 15 days, it'll stay that uh, process as we follow that, uh, I guess, appeals, if that's the correct terminology for it. The appeal code that we just rewrote, I think, last year. Council what? Oh, yes. Um, so my question is, what, what happens if you catch somebody who is doing graffiti? They'll, if we can find somebody who's actually doing graffiti, that's a malicious mischief, which is a criminal charge. Uh, and probably the next question here, can they paint be ca cause the paint over it? I know that's one question a lot of people ask. And that would be up to a court. So typically, they tend to not do that because people don't want them back on their property. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, I just, they, I, they get held responsible for a crime. I guess I just, the only thing that I respectfully disagree with is that um, I think that the burden should fall on the person who did the graffiti, not the business owner, ultimately. I mean, the business owner didn't break the law, right? Like, a person did. Um, and I know, I know that you don't, there's not cameras in a lot of places or you're not watching when this happens a lot, but um, I do think that it needs to be cleaned up. So I, I agree with the code, I'm, I mean, I support it, but I think that ultimately, and this may be the mom in me coming out, that the responsibility ultimately the people that are doing the graffiti need to be held accountable in some way and i know that that might not mean that they can clean it up like you said that people might not want that but that is where the problem is ultimately how often and, are you, and, in you response to that, people, uh, probably well, not it, but it, i'm just it saying yeah. you know in response to that and we, <coughs> we did this in my former jurisdiction where i worked before there was a lot of discussion about that a lot of concern about that and it's appropriate the, the reality is um, most of the time it's something other than a business being very burden to cost uh, but the other piece of that is if I find somebody doing graffiti on your business and I can prove they did it we can ask the judge to implement uh, a restitution for that person with dollar amount the judge could also be asked to uh, as part of that sentence have that person go and and do the paint over of that there are some some labor issues, LNI issues, things like that that come into play, especially when you're talking minors, which are the majority of these types of uh, offenders, uh, because of the uh, of their youth. You know, we used to a long time ago where I worked before take some minors out to do that. It stopped because of some liability concerns and with, with judges. But nothing says that we can't ask the judge, and we always do ask for restitution. That's what part of the prosecution is. Nothing says you can't ask for them to be part of the, the cleanup too. So that is a possibility through the criminal court system rather than through the ordinance. Thank you. That's all. Councilor Eisen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I was surprised going through this that it doesn't appear that graffiti was even in. It wasn't defined as a nuisance at all. Like you didn't change it; you added it, right? I would argue though that um, graffiti is inherently a nuisance, and it could have fallen under the code. Sure. The difference here is adding the summary abatement process. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I was just like, oh, yeah, just to find graffiti. Um, this is just a total out of curiosity. Loved everything Erica said. If you had to put a percentage on it, how often do you actually catch the person that did the graffiti? <laughs> just sheer curiosity. Say. You know, I, I think it varies upon jurisdictions and, and areas. Uh, you know, I think we had a 20% solving factor where I was at before. I think here it might be a little higher because we don't get as much right. and we're able to. I, I can't put a number if I had to guess I would say 30 to 40 percent because we don't have a lot um, it, but that's just a guess that's higher than I thought it yeah. would have thought it would be I think he's probably virtually you know, never you know, catch the guy and some of the times and, and we haven't encountered it too much here and that's why we're I'm thankful for that and this is just a preventative thing for future it's good to have in place to help get it covered over we were reactive where I was at we're proactive here with trying to, to do this but uh, you know, oftentimes you can have graffiti that does not go solved, and then six months later they do something else that matches all that other graffiti, and sometimes you can hold them accountable for it. So you know, it just varies. Mayor Brody. Um, Chief, if I not mistaken, uh, and we are so lucky to not really have gang games here, but that can be a problem, and I can see that you would want it gone quickly within the 50, by 15 days otherwise they just start tagging everything it's one game against the other fortunately we don't have that and i pray we don't but at least as you say we're proactive and it covers 
Yeah, and that's one of the multiple reasons, but that would certainly be one. In my other jurisdiction is a different issue. That's that one of the issues here um, because of what they use it for. So here, it's a little different. So I think it's on the scheduled agenda for the seventh. Okay, next meeting. Questions? Anyone thank else? Thank you, both of you, for being proactive. Yes, it's thank nice you. to be ahead of things, right? Okay. You've got so much time. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to use time. So we will move on then to our last item. Uh, is under administration, administrator's report. Okay. Mr. Oborn. I'll do my quick go through and then open it up for questions at the end. So uh, first thing, call your attention, city uh, council retreat uh, with uh, department heads also present, February 1st, 2020, it's a Saturday, so mark your calendar. Uh, facilitated by Mike Bailey with the MRSC, a lot of experience and I think it'll be helpful to be part of that process. Um, skipping legislative outreach, going down to Arts Commission. Um, still working on the Sculpture Park and we're kind of doing a community and, and interested party meeting coming up. I have that January 9th, but it didn't work to one of the, some of the applicants, so we're rescheduling that. So sometimes I write this a week in advance and so some of the things have to be changed on it. So we'll continue to work on on getting that meeting together and kind of getting a plan moving forward for the sculpture park. Um, then uh, also with Arts Commission, the November Creative Arts Fund report is attached in there. So any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer. Um, moving on to community support. Um, I, I participated as a panelist in the Climate Change Conservation Forum hosted by Langley Mayor Tim Callison on November 15th. Uh, Attach is a really good booklet um, compiled by city staff and really showing all the initiatives we do uh, regarding uh, recycling and, and green initiatives. So we, we're certainly probably out of the four municipalities there, I think we're the most advanced. And I think that's something we need to brag about. Some of it's required because we're larger and we have to do more things, but you know, if we're required to do it, it's still, it's still a, uh, something I think we could take credit for. So, uh, so I think we, we looked really good there. Um, one of the persons asked about what happened with the 2006 initiative, um, the CLEI, and you know, we embedded it into our practices and continue to do efforts on recycling and, and green initiatives. So, uh, a lot to be proud of there, and I appreciate the effort of staff in putting that together, that booklet there. So it's something that's a really good resource. Uh, economic development, uh, continue to work with uh, Anna Cordes on wet fiber, so moving ahead in that area. Um, so some initial things that might be um, free um, in some of the lines over across on the other side of the bridge there, and then we'll come back with some other initiatives um, in steps here and phasing that in. And, and hopefully move towards the uh, first um, city in, in North America to have leak detection with this European technology. So uh, it's kind of tentative so far. Go ahead. Um, do we need to mention that this is dark fiber, that this is not a lie that's going through? In other words, it isn't lit up or whatever? Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's just we're doing it initially for water um, and leak detection, and then it'll have the capability for additional fibers on there. Um, but we're justifying and using it as a water initially to start, and then uh, it'll kind of dovetail into the other plan there with the uh, backbone model. And it's way too early to tell whether we want to go through the same model as as uh, Anna Cordes and do a utility, but certainly we'll all evaluate that. We're kind of sandwiched between two interests that want to do fiber, so it's kind of nice because Port, uh, Port um, uh, Coopville Port Authority is kind of taking the initiative of doing a county-wide study, and then Anna Cordes is, uh, is set up to have us piggyback off them, kind of like they are with water, with, with, with wet fiber, it's already in the water line, so it just makes sense to our water line's larger um, in that same area on, on the other island, Fidego Island, so it makes sense to put it into our line as opposed to theirs, so there's some benefit with that. And then by doing that, it really brings down the cost 
with them paying most of the cost for it on that. And then we'll obviously have to bear the cost for um, going from Deception Pass to Alt Field, Alt Tank, Alt Field Road Tank first, and then uh, a lot of other complications beyond that. But the initial area with leak detection um, is simpler to deal with, but a lot of issues more to come on that issue. A comment, um, I've been in on a few of the discussions, the leak detection, they can tell if it was a car that went over the pipe within, what, three centimeters, I think, yeah. or if a dog. I mean, it is just amazing, and it saves a ton of time. Is it about, it, it's just an amazing thing. Yeah. If we have so much that, that isn't populated, but the line is going through, instead of wait until the water spot comes up or something like that, or we see our meter run around too much. I, I just think it's incredible to be able to cover all of that. So I think it's very exciting. Yeah. Moving on, uh, Whidbey Island Marathon 2020. Um, I am working with the race director uh, and uh, working with the Navy on trying to get the uh, the race to go through the seaplane base. And so that has some advantages of taking hills out, one of the and, and utilizing a beautiful scenery there. So uh, more to come on that issue and working with the, the staff over there and trying to come up upon a agreed upon route and, and procedures. And then kind of the call attention to is uh, the marathon will be the first large event to be held at Windjammer Park. So really excited about that. So um, moving on to uh, citizen comments. Um, City Council has been receiving postcards from the mailers sponsored by the Washington Realtors Association. Rather than go into detail, I just want to make sure you're aware that the complete folder of these postcards, since there's quite a lot of them, we're not giving mic and copies to you, but it's in the near the uh, cl city clerk's office there above your little folder on top of your mailbox. So you're welcome to go through that. If you want copies and stuff, let us know. But we're just kind of keeping it all together into cluster. And if you look on there, I think if you do the total, we've got 28 postcards received to date. So some of them are the standard ones, and some of them have individual have decided to vary from the message provided by the Washington <laughs> Realtors Association and wrote, written in their own message. So we want to call your attention to that. And I think they also have a website where they can shoot things to you, send things automatically, the Realtors Association website. We don't know that anybody's used that. We don't see it on our level, um, but you may get a, a, uh, a uh, email, kind of a draft email. If they want to they want to support this, they push a button and it'll go to all your you guys will receive. We did one test run, <laughs> so you might have saw just to, uh, to test it to see if it worked. And so I just, we wanted to keep you aware of that. Moving on to development of services. Um, some upcoming developments that have the clearing going on right now and then are close to getting their civil plans. Uh, Marion Woods, 43 homes subdivision. It's been on the developers kind of had that on the hold for quite a while and it looks like it's moving ahead. Uh, the Hillside Scenic Heights, that was approved. Uh, 11 lots move, close to moving ahead. And then the Terrace uh, apartment complex. 60 unit apartment complex. So we got some good pro progress there and, and projects that are, that are coming online. So um, moving on to Marina, um, working on restarting the Salmon Recovery Program. So that's been kind of uh, since 2012, we haven't been doing it, but uh, the Marina's motivated, the mayor's helping out with some fundraising for equipment there uh, to get that pr program uh, restarted again. So. Um, moving on, fire department has their new command unit. They're very proud of and, mm -hmm. and it's functional now, right? Uh, so um, good progress there. In uh, human resources, um, new position, the public information officer was created and this is a reclassification of the assistant to the mayor's position. So that's something we're trying to squeeze it out. Trying to get a new position was really difficult, but trying to reclassify it out of an existing position is a is a good way to, to get that effort going. So, um, then the next one uh, on the next page there, continuing with uh, human resources, uh, we're working on increased safety measures at City Hall, pulling this closed and locking the door over here, um, doing some configuration with locks that you guys were all aware of, 
um, and then also doing some measures with the restrooms here and then uh, long term we probably need to talk about that so in the 2021-22 budget we'll probably talk about some long-term configurations that we need to do to improve safety in this building of employees but we're just doing uh, some short smaller uh, inexpensive measures that we can do now and staff certainly appreciates that uh, police department carpet being installed there good effort there and doing some remodeling and trying to keep the cost down <coughs> and then they had their um, own uh, three-day supervisor sergeant retreat so good training there uh, public works uh, clean water facility report monthly report is attached in your and, and behind my report here, uh, Navy negotiations, the last comment we have with them, they're going to submit a counter offer to us um, sometime in January. So uh, wait to hear from them. They've been doing some looking at doing a lot of vetting of our current uh, report, asking additional questions that we provide, continue to provide them. And then they've been committed. They kind of pushed back the date a little longer, so this is the latest date. So it, we may get it or they may push it back, but I'm just giving you the latest information. Um, the Harbor Heights Regional uh, Park purchase. Um, we're doing some environmental and a surveying of last things that need to be done as part of our due diligence, and we're on target for mid-January 2020 closing. So once we get that, then you'll see a lot of activity on that we've already talked about that for the comp plan for the zoning change and so a number of things will be on that designation of the park and, and a lot of initiatives there and and then trying to uh, spend the three hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollar what youth athletic field grant that we have we're not using it in the purchase price but i think we have a few years to to do that in our first phase and so staff's got a good uh, initial plan and we'll, we'll get more on that so and then uh, down to uh, senior services, their new sign is up and being very effective and, and really promoting events and getting people in the door. So uh, it's just been a highly successful uh, thing there with putting that sign up. And then along with that sign was the rebranding. Um, so they have a target of January 2nd, 2020 to become the center, you know, Carver activities and resources for 50 plus or short the center so uh, any questions <laughs> I just have a quick comment um, I was reading that uh, former mayor Al Puji left an endowment um, to the senior center which I think um, I, I was really happy to see I this is something that's totally irrelevant to everything we're talking about, but um, I know that for years and years, um, Al Pucci would like, pay the membership to the senior center for seniors that maybe wanted to go and couldn't afford it, and he did that anonymously for years and years and years, and um, I just always appreciated that and kind of wanted to say so in public since he did it anonymously, so um, I, yeah, I'm happy to see that. I think that they do a lot of the work and a lot of support, so it makes me happy to see that. Yeah. Good people. Yeah, and he was very involved in the foundation that helps raise money for helping offset expenses at the uh, senior center or the center after January That's 2nd. <laughs> so I appreciate his efforts there, yeah. I, I Thank he, you. I think he chose that foundation. Uh, the code, the timeline. Yeah. He, he was the chair of the foundation. So, you know, that was probably soon after finished his term as mayor that he took over the foundation chairman for the center. And, and so, you know, one of the longest um, um, positions that he held. You know, not only did he uh, chair the NAS would be task force up until about a year ago, but he, he was the chair of that foundation. So, you know, quite a contribution. <laughs> so, any other um, any other questions? Administrators report. Okay, Count City Council business. Mayor Pro This is a question for. Would you like me to come join you again? Oh sure. Oh. I will 
was writing the answer. <laughs> Although I don't know the question. <laughs> um, so I know that we just um, approved the use sailing and the construction of that building, but I know there's a step two and three. So there you will leave a file so that someone can follow through because yes. I know there's a lot of stuff shuffling back and forth in agreement and just hope that this is very successful. But when the person who negotiated it goes away, I just want to be sure that so there's a, a someone's going to be able to follow in your footsteps of what you all the work you have put into it graciously. It so. is it is written in my file, but I also told Mr. Sublet that I owed him an agreement, um, and I will get that to him by next week. Oh, okay. Yes, and so he's expecting it. And then the the other part of that is a resolution accepting the donation, which um, is very easy to do. Okay. All right. I just want to. You put a lot of work in there. There's been a lot of back and forth, and it's a good program uh, for youth and, and even adults. And I just don't want to see it fall through the crack because someone who's done so much work on it isn't here. So I, I promise I will have it done by next week. Hmm. I don't care what I said. Just, <laughs> just before you leave, someone has the keys or file to it. Thank you so much. You're I appreciate welcome. it. You're welcome. So this is not related to that particular thing, but since you did talk about the marina uh, earlier. Uh, I did want to say that I, I, I'm excited to work with Chris, Chris Sublet with that uh, Salmon Rearing program that we used to do down there, did for many years. Um, we're, we're planning to rebuild, uh, and, and I think we'll, we'll have some uh, the school helping us. We've got, we've got people from the district, two or three people that Chris has been communicating with uh, we plan to build the pins ourselves, uh, obviously with Marina help, but uh, overseeing it, but bringing some students in to do that. Um, and then uh, we should get the baby, and they are Chinook salmon, which is pretty exciting because in the past I think we've had uh, blend or at least uh, uh, more silver salmon in the past, but these are scheduled to be Chinook salmon and um, uh, should be here uh, this next year. Uh, and then we'll be back to you know having the, the classes come down and and help feed them and and, uh, and then release them when we when we get to that point. So it's going to be a lot of fun, and uh, I think we'll need. It sounds to me like we'll need somewhere around seventy five hundred dollars <coughs> to buy the nets. But you know that's what I'm going to uh, try to raise, and maybe even some more. Uh, so. Stay tuned. We're going to have some fun with that one. That's for sure. Um, any other business or questions? Or? If we have none, then we are going to adjourn early. Thank you. Thank you.